we on the American right who oppose tariffs, you know, traditional free market conservatives, are subjected to all manner of abuse these days. Uh, Pro-tariff, pro-industrial policy advocates accuse us of being market fundamentalists, radical libertarians, unidimensional thinkers. We're told that we don't understand the needs of a strong national defense, a strong American manufacturing sector. We don't understand what American workers need in support from the government. We don't understand how foreign countries are ripping Americans off. Now, even if all of this were true, it still begs one big whopping question. Will tariffs actually achieve the policy aims which they set out to achieve? Today, to answer this question, I'm joined by Brian Riley, the director of the National Taxpayer Union's Free Trade Initiative. I'm David McGarry, a policy analyst at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, and this is an installment in a video series from TPA's Free Trade Center detailing the ways that protectionism and tariffs harm the U.S. economy and create dysfunction in the political sector along the way. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me on. So let's start where so many advocates of tariffs start, which is in the manufacturing sector. So tell me, have the Trump and Biden tariffs of the last few years actually succeeded in restoring the U.S. manufacturer and supporting the U.S. manufacturing workforce? Well, the short answer to that is no. Um, the, the longer answer is a little bit more nuanced. Um, but I would, I would start out by saying a lot of people, when they look at the strength of U.S. manufacturing, uh, they'll look at the number of jobs we have, which is one way to gauge manufacturing. And I'll, and I'll get into that. And they will say, look, since the since NAFTA and since we started trading with China, we lost a bunch of manufacturing jobs. Therefore, things are awful. I don't think that's the best way to measure the strength of the manufacturing industry. Um, in part, that maybe is just something that was ingrained in me having grown up in the Midwest in a farm background where there were fewer and fewer farmers every year. You know, something going back decades, fewer farmers because we in the agriculture sector got more and more productive. Um, the world's breadbasket, uh, fewer farmers produce more food, which I think is a pretty good thing, uh, if not a great thing. Same, same thing, it looks like the, the numbers in manufacturing show pretty much the, sa the same thing. So the number of manufacturing workers, I'm, I'm going to clarify this um, before I make a false statement, but for decades, uh, the share of our economy that was made up uh, by manufacturing workers had been declining. More workers were in the services industries and, and, and things like that. Um, by the way, that's a trend that goes back uh, decades. And if you look at when the North American Free Trade Agreement was negotiated or when China joined the World Trade Organization, you can't tell that by looking at the graph of the job changes. It was a long-term trend and people try and blame it on China or blame it on trade. I mean, it really doesn't have much to do with trade at all. I think it makes a whole lot more sense to look at the output of our manufacturing sector, which it goes up and down, but it's been increasing. Uh, it is, if not at a record high today, at close to a record high. And if we have fewer workers producing more and more goods, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you look at job changes, by the way, um, to say we have fewer manufacturing jobs in many cases, that's because manufacturing workers had the opportunity to move into better jobs in, in, in other sectors. So, um, and, and today, I think it's really important to keep in mind, we can discuss, and I'm happy to debate what happened after and after and, and, and um, as a result of imports and, and all that controversial stuff. But if we're worried about today and the future, the big problem if you talk to any manufacturing, almost any manufacturing em employer is, I can't find workers. We don't have enough workers to fill the jobs we had. So let's try and figure out how to address that problem, which is the real problem. Um, you know, and be aware of what's happened in the past, but not just assume that uh, we're we're at a risk of losing our manufacturing base because of imports. Because the facts, in terms of our production, our productivity. The facts certainly do not bear that out. And um, that's something, by the way, um, different people can can kind of argue over which sectors benefit the most from trade. And well, maybe Brian's wrong. We should look at the number of jobs. But it's 
weird to me sometimes to even have these discussions, David. Um, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm talking about, uh, is the earth, here's why the earth is round. Everybody knows the earth is round. If you're talking to economists, 95% of economists, according to the American Economics Association, believe trade is good, um, tariffs and quotas reduce U.S. economic welfare. Now, that's not some kind of blanket, radical, market fundamentalist statement. That's just what mainstream economists believe. And uh, many of them would believe, like I do, is there are exceptions, right? That's not some kind of flat blanket, you know, never, uh, there, there are never any nuances, never any exceptions. I think that they, there are. But if you look at what has worked, not just in terms of the uh, economic theory, things that Adam Smith said, that David Ricardo said, um, but you look at the facts, the countries around the world that are more open to trade also tend to be more prosperous and happy to delve into some of the reasons that is. But, but in the, when the last administration put tariffs on imports and the Biden administration maintained most of those tariffs, they're tariffs on things like steel and aluminum from, from our allies. Well, if you're a manufacturer in the United States and you have to pay more for steel, more for aluminum, you have to pay more for the parts that you need to compete against your, your international competitors, that makes it harder to manufacture in the United States, not easier. So really what these tariffs do more often is they pit they, they pit one manufacturer against another or one sector of the economy against the other. Um, maybe there's some political benefits to doing it, but e economically, again, I think those 95% of economists would, would say this is not a good plan. Yeah, I think it's so telling that every time we review the effects of tariffs, um, you'll see that the protected industry will have some kind of uh, job preservation or gain of a few thousand workers, each one at the cost, by the way, of nigh on a million dollars a piece. Um, and then you look at downstream industries and you'll find that they've lost employment many fold, um, many fold more than the than the protected industry ha has gained. Um, exactly. Another, David. A lot of times those losses are spread out across the country where the benefits are really concentrated. Um, I think a good example might be the sugar industry where Americans pay twice the world price for sugar. As a result, candy is more expensive. Um, when we go buy sugar at the grocery store, it's more expensive. It's just a little bit more expensive for most of us. Um, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Even most people aren't even aware of the extra they're paying. Um, they're not going to form lobbying coalitions to come to D.C. and demand that uh, the policy changes. But if you're one of the handful, relative handful of sugar producers in the U.S., this is your lifeblood. And you will sink tons of resources into maintaining those trade barriers because the benefits of that are, are very concentrated um, where the costs are spread out across the economy. And that's why groups like the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, the National Taxpayers Union are so important to try and defend uh, the common interests of Americans. Dispersed costs, concentrated benefits is a hell of a formula for rent seeking. All right, um, I could talk about domestic manufacturing and, and, and trade policy for I'm sure another several hours, but I wanna move on to a different topic. Um, China is the boogeyman um, and oftentimes for, for good reason. Um, there are many concerns with Chinese trade practices, uh, domestic subsidies, um, the way they, they they treat intellectual property, et cetera. Have tariffs, uh, have, have the Section 301 tariffs that President Trump imposed, um, and, the, and also I should add that the President Biden added a whole new raft of Section 301 tariffs earlier, have they actually succeeded in, in changing Chinese behavior and in the larger scheme of things, um, did the the vaunted trade war with China and and the deals that came out of that actually secure meaningful wins for American industry? Well, let me tell you before I share my opinion. Let me tell you what President Biden's trade representative found, because um, those tariffs that were put in place by Trump, they're set to last for four years. Unless the USTR uh, uh, undertakes a big review of the policies, did they work, didn't they work, and then they can be extended. So uh, the Biden administration came out with this 
uh, massive review of the impact. I say Section 301 tariffs, to be clear. Those are the tariffs that were put on imports from China. The legal goal of those Section 301 tariffs on imports from China was to convince and persuade uh, China to change some of its unfair trade practices, which it, it has engaged in, things like um, intellectual property theft, things like requiring U.S. firms to, to do joint ventures with Chinese firms if they want to go into their market. Um, so that was the goal. What USTR found was there were maybe some areas here and there where there were some small improvements, but that over and all, overall, uh, the tariffs did not work. And overall, um, China's practices got worse almost ac across the board. And there's a list of, of example of example of example in, in the uh, table of contents of the USTR report, which you can look up for yourself at USTR.gov, of ways in which China's policies got worse. Now, the Biden administration's uh, response to the tariffs not working was to extend the tariffs and to add even more tariffs, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, economically, but uh, I understand the political reasons for doing so. So absolutely, um, the tariffs did not work. Now, if you look at it more broadly, um, in my opinion, the China's actions, whether you're talking about their trade policies or their human rights policies, their military policies, um, they're all worse today than they were before the trade war. So, does, so, so I think there are things that we can do and should do to try and, and, and encourage China to adopt better policies, not to rip off Americans. Um, the tariffs on China did have some effects. They, they drove up prices for Americans. But they also encourage some more production outside of China. So I, I don't mean to say that they had no impact. Um, but the USTR report, US Trade Representative report that I just mentioned, also found that um, the preponderance of economic research has shown that for the US perspective, the economic costs outweighed the economic benefits. Now, somebody might say, Brian, I don't care. China's awful. We just should not trade with them. And if we want to, if you want to ask me diplomatic or foreign policy or defense questions, I'm happy to discuss that. But I think we need to recognize that this stuff is going to cost us. And if it's a cost we think is, that needs to be paid, um, you know, that's that's something to debate. But the idea that the tariffs come with no cost, or even worse, the people who say tariffs are going to make us stronger, well, that's, there's no evidence to support that. All it does is drive up costs for Americans, not just consumers, but manufacturers. Um, the farmers who lost access to their largest export market because China retaliated, even after the Trump administration said, oh, nobody's going to retaliate. They all retaliated. So it was across the board a failure. And once again, that's not just my opinion as some free market advocate. That's not some free market fundamentalist um, think tank or, or um, specific industry view. That's the view of the Biden administration. Um, and and I, I agree with it. Yeah, I think I think you bring up you bring up the unanimity of economists on this issue. It reminds me there's a there's a joke about rabbis that I think you can use for economists. Ten economists, eleven opinions, um, and somehow all the economists, including the government's economists, who are who have an interest, if anything, in advocating a more aggressive trade policy and a more aggressive tariff policy, all agree that these things don't exactly work in the way that they're set out to. Um, and I think the fundamental point is that protectionists will often say, if you think X is a problem, you must therefore support tariffs to solve X. And there's very little thought that's put to the question of, well, what if tariffs won't solve X? What if tariffs will make X worse or perhaps maybe marginally better, and then impose a whole raft of economic costs, which we're told we're not supposed to think about. Um, so let me, since we've sort of covered some of the domestic failures, we've covered the foreign policy um, and geopolitical failures. Let me ask you as a way of wrapping up, are there any other tariff failures that you'd like to highlight? Well, we had it. Um, pretty easy as somebody, uh, if I say we, I mean the defenders of free trade, going back to the smooth hauling tariff, which were big tariff hikes, which if, if they didn't cause the depression, they exacerbated the depression. 
Um, by the way, we had trade surpluses throughout the Great Depression because we were too poor to afford imports. Um, when we had the Great Recession uh, here more recently, our trade deficit went down again because our economy was weaker. We couldn't afford to, to import as much. But so there was a bipartisan consensus um, coming out of the Depression. Uh, for economic reasons, we need to reduce trade barriers, not just abroad, but here in the United States. Um, and it wasn't just an economically driven decision, it was uh, a foreign policy driven decision, which was we don't want to have another Great Depression. We also don't want to have another world war after we just had two. Um, so how can we have uh, stronger uh, relations, more peaceful relationships, and expanding trade and reducing trade barriers is, is one way to do that. You know, more trade doesn't guarantee anything, but it does uh, create peaceful and stronger relationships between people in, in different countries. So it was um, a, a, a tremendous benefit economically, uh, contributed to economic growth in the United States. Foreign trade barriers were falling significantly ever since the end of World War II, not in a straight line, but, but they were declining. After 94, when we created the World Trade Organization led by the United States and the North American Free Trade Agreements and subsequent agreements, foreign trade barriers continued to fall. So when somebody says, when a politician says, oh, foreign countries are ripping us off, their tariffs are a lot higher than ours. Um, that's true in a lot of cases right now, but right now they're our average tariff is closer to our trading partner's average tariff. Um, and in large part, that's because of this idea we're going to have mutually beneficial trade agreements as opposed to the, I want to say older approach, but maybe it's now it's the, the new approach, new old, new old approach, I don't know. But um, the idea that we don't like your trade policy, so we're going to put tariffs on until you change it. And then the foreign country says, you can't tell us what to do. That's not how things work. We're going to raise tariffs on your exports. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. Uh, President Reagan compared it to um, pie fights in those old black and white movies where one person throws a pie, uh, the other person throws a pie back back at them. And before you know it, you have a, a big mess. Um, but it's, as he pointed out, it's not a comedy, it's a tragedy because it's something that makes us poor and, and hurts people in the United States. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing in the historical sweep of things, because the idea that international trade is zero sum has really pervaded most, most politics throughout history. I mean, go back to the mercantilists that Adam Smith was critiquing. Um, the 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 idea that the idea that America will be poor somehow if if large scale imports are are allowed to are allowed to occur um also just as 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 a note as someone who has a bunch of bugaboos about trade policy and in, in the history of protectionism it's not actually true that the united states in um in the 19th century gained massively from an economic perspective from protectionism uh, if you go back to the best that we can tell the united states if anything was held back marginally by protectionism and of course it was a very different economy a very different um uh, global economy for that matter. Um, and the lessons can't be easily transferred to to today. But it's simply not true that tariffs were the genesis of American wealth in the 19th century. Um, and then as you point out, also, obviously, Smoot Hawley and retaliation to it had a massively, hugely negative um, uh, uh, effect on, on America during the Depression. Um, I We'll call it there. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been fantastic. Um, as we as we um, sort of began, I will end just because you think or just because you say that your favorite policy will solve some problem does not actually mean that in the real world, it will actually solve that problem. This is a basic le lesson of economics, a basic lesson of politics, a basic lesson, frankly, of human action and human nature. We have a knowledge problem for the, for, we have the knowledge problem for a reason. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing the op-eds and blog posts that you produce going forward. Well, I think we're going to have uh, plenty of opportunity to produce more op-eds and, and uh, to work with Taxpayers Protection Alliance and, and other groups.
um, on this issue going forward and appreciate you having me on. These are these are important issues and thank you for taking the time. It was my pleasure and I encourage everyone to go look at what NTU is doing and to go look and follow, uh, look at and follow what Brian's doing. Thanks so much.